Morning. Good morning. Is that it? Hooray. Good morning. And welcome to Tillicutri Baptist Church. I was going to say it's great standing up here seeing all your happy smiley faces, but actually I'm just hoping you're smiling under your mask because that's all I can see. Um, but anyway, it's good to have you here um, in Tilly Baptist this morning. You're very welcome and also welcome to those who are joining us later online. You're also welcome and we trust that as we spend time together with God, you will be blessed. Also, a very warm welcome um, to Chris Townsend and his family, Jenny and the, the children. Very good to have you uh, here this morning. We look forward to hearing what you have to say to us later. Um, I asked for a, a little bit of a bio because it's always good just to get a wee bit of background of the folk that are coming in. Um, and Chris and his wife run a B&B on the east shore of Loch Lomond, which I'm very jealous. It's a lovely place. Um, so, and also Jenny works a primary school teacher at the same time. But Chris has just graduated from Scottish Baptist College as well and will soon be later this summer taking up a pastoral vacancy um, in Central Baptist in Paisley. So we wish him all the very best and every blessing as he takes up that uh, ministry there. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming through this morning. A couple of other just very brief announcements. Um, this is the, the end of the, the elder process. Today is the last day. Um, probably, I think it's midday if I'm Frank's nodding and giving me a thumbs up today. So if you've got your bits of paper, great. Give them to Elaine. Um, if you're doing it online, get on your phone and get it done. <laughs> um, the other thing, obviously, is to encourage you to book up for the services. I got a message from John through the week. Um, I think everybody's doing this whole Christian thing of let's just hold off but just in case somebody else wants to book a seat. So I won't. I'll just, just book them. As you can see, we've, we've, got, we've got spaces. Please just go ahead and book, and particularly for the church meeting on Wednesday the 9th of June, our AGM. We're hoping to do a hybrid um, where we'll have people in the church, but also we'll have a, a Zoom meeting um, at the same time. Hopefully, if the IT... Um, if, am I allowed to name the company? No. I'd better... No. Um, <laughs> let's just say they're B-Lumen t Arable at the moment. Um, and thank you to the tech team who are spending hours on the phone and all the rest of it trying to get this sorted out. So hopefully we will be sorted out um, for then. And I think, unless anybody's going to jump up and down at me, that is all I have to say. So we'll pass across to the worship team. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see your smiling eyes. Um, we're going to start with a call to worship, which is a beautiful um, mashup of some lovely psalms. The words in bold are for you to say along with me. And actually, I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able, because I think we end up sitting down a lot now. We're not standing to sing. So wouldn't you stand with me? And the words in bold are for you. So it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God the great King above all gods. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name.
Lord, thank you that through all of this, you are with us. You promise to meet with us this morning by your Holy Spirit. You promise to comfort and encourage, to stir up and to challenge. Lord, we're here for you. We are your people, the sheep of your flock. Amen. And now I think we have a video from Claire. Hi there everyone, Claire here. I'm here to tell you about the parable of the talents. Now, the parable is a story with special meaning to help us understand our relationship with God. And in this story, the master is like God and the servants are like us. If you want to follow along, it's in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. It's also like a man going on an extended trip. He called his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one he gave $5,000. To another, 2000 To a third, 1000 depending on their abilities. Then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same. But the man with a single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given $5,000 showed to him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with 2000 showed he also had doubled his master's investment. His master commended him. Good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowance for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you, so I found a great hiding place and secured your money. Here it is safe and sound, down to the last cent. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been invested the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most, and get rid of this play it safe one who won't go out on a limb, threw him out into utter darkness. So what does this all mean? Well, the first thing is that God is generous and gives us gifts that we like and enjoy and can handle. In the story, the master gave each servant the right amount of money they could handle and trusted them. God does that with us, giving us gifts. It could be money, toys, as well as skills like playing the guitar or fixing things. He wants us to use his gifts well, so others will benefit from our music. For example, we have a brilliant music team and we've all been blessed to be able to enjoy their playing when we can't even sing. The next thing is that we have to choose and decide to use our gifts that God gives us to his glory. Like in the parable, the first two servants, they looked after the money the master gave them. They put it to good use until he returned. And in the same way, one day Jesus will return and we'll have to tell him what we've done with our gifts. It's our choice. So I'd like us to just think now, look at your hands and decide how do you use your hands? Is it for cooking? Is it fixing things? Cleaning? Do you play a musical instrument? 
for yourself and others to enjoy? Do you use your hands to help people? How do you use your hands to help God and others? Think now, when you put your hands together and say, Dear Lord, thank you for all the good gifts you give us and talents that you have chosen specially for me. And I pray that you will help us to know how to use them wisely for you until you come again. Amen. Thank you, Claire and the Lego um, actors. <laughs> We're going to spend some time in prayer. There are a few bits for you to say along with me, um, and I'll prompt you, but do feel free to close your eyes in prayer. I'll let you know when there are words on the screen. Lord, as we quiet ourselves just now, in these moments of stillness, we lift our hearts to you in prayer, and we all say together, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy Spirit, please guide me now as I pray. Bring to mind a moment when you really used me this week, where you spoke and I listened, where I was able to serve someone and be your hands and feet. God, where did I feel most alive and full of your spirit this week? Loving God, would you bring to mind a moment this week where I fell short, where I sinned against you or someone else? Maybe something I did when no one was looking, something I said that was hurtful, something I thought. Maybe I said something that was absolutely true, but the energy behind it was ugly. Father God, please bring my sin to my mind. And let's say together, Lord God, I have sinned against you. I have done evil in your sight. I'm sorry and repent. Have mercy on me according to your love. Wash away my wrongdoing and cleanse me from my sin. Renew a right spirit within me and restore the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. And finally, gracious God, because I have been forgiven so much, would you bring to mind one person that I need to forgive today? Did someone say, do or not do, something that was hurtful to me and I need to forgive them? Or maybe a system or a culture or a rule that I resent or a disappointment that follows me around? Oh God, who do I need to forgive them today? And let's say together, God, I forgive them. Help me to let it go. I release them. I let them off the hook by the power and grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
Holy Spirit, would you speak in the silence and the quiet of our hearts? And now would you speak through the words of your scripture, through what you've laid on Chris's heart as he's prepared for today? Uh, Would you bless him? Would you fill him with your spirit? Give us hearts open and spirits quick to respond to what you have for us this morning. Amen many things that have got much more complicated over the past year and a bit is uh, the pressing question of when you can take your mask off to put your microphone on. But I've long since given up thinking that there is any way to look dignified in all of this. It is what it is. Um, Good morning, everybody. Thank you for for inviting me here this morning. Um, As you've already heard, my name is Chris. Um, I have just well, I say I've just graduated. I am waiting for my final marks from the University of the West of Scotland, which, which validates the degrees uh, conferred by the Scottish Baptist College in Paisley. So I think I am a graduate uh, in theology and pastoral studies. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but uh, hopefully, if, if it has all gone horribly wrong, then that doesn't take away from anything that I have to say to you in the next little while. Um, I am going to speak to you about the parable of the talents, uh, except without the assistance of Lego, for which I can only apologize. Um, if I had only realized, <laughs> I would have brought some, uh, some props with me. Uh, but let's read it again first. I'm going to read it from the, the NRSV, which is not one commonly used on the pews, but it's the one we use at the Baptist College. And actually, I think in 
in this particular parable, I think it, it brings some details out somewhat better than the one you probably have in your hands. So I'm, I'm not here to be a salesman for any particular translation, but as I read this, if it doesn't quite read the way you're following it, then that's why. So this is the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So, take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this parable sits in a series in which Jesus is talking about the end times. And there's much in the parable before it and there's much in the parable after it, which is another very familiar story, the story of the sheep and the goats, that says what things are going to be like at the end of times, at the end of the world. And we like to fixate on the end of the world, don't we? It makes a really good story. Uh, we like to sit up and speculate, certainly back in the, uh, back in the days uh, of youth group, uh, which Andy and I probably still remember. Um, there was much sitting around speculating um, back in the day of, oh, what will the end of the world be like? Uh, and then when Jenny and I first got married, this series of books came out. You may have come across them, they're called the Left Behind series. And we read them avidly until we realized that they were just bringing out more and more books to sell books. And, they, and the guys that were writing it really didn't have a clue what they were talking about. They made one of the books into a film starring Nicolas Cage, which is like a dreadful 1970s airport disaster film. It doesn't really tell you anything useful about the end times. I'm talking about the 1970s, if you're old enough, you might remember a very famous film of the period called The Omen, with about a child called Damien who literally had a 666 tattooed on his forehead. We love to speculate about what's going to go on at the end of the world. What I would like for us to do this morning is not fixate 
on this being a parable about settling of accounts at the end of the world because it's got far more to say to us about life in the kingdom of God now, much more to say about life in the kingdom of God now than it has to say about what will happen at the end. Important though that is, and that message is there, and we won't ignore it, but what we must not do is ignore the really important stuff that it has to say about life here and now. So we've got this parable about talents. So what's it all about? Well, listen, first of all, it's not about money. Now, a talent in the parable is a measure, it's a weight, it's a measure of a bag of gold. It's actually a phenomenally large amount of gold. Um, One talent of gold is about as much as a laborer would expect to earn in 15 years. It's difficult to kind of relate what a laborer would have earned back then to what you might earn now. I guess the nearest equivalent that we've got to it would be like the national minimum wage. So if you're an adult working at the national minimum wage, uh, then you would expect to earn about £225,000 in 15 years. I certainly wouldn't feel like it, and then the government will come and take all its tax and everything else. But the figure that I'm going with is £225,000 in 15 years. So the guy who got one talent got a bag of gold worth a quarter of a million pounds-ish. Two talents, half a million. And the one who got five talents, well, he's got one and a quarter million pounds worth of gold in his hands. It's a huge amount. Huge amount. And that is something that we need to keep right in the very hearts of our hearts of our minds, minds of our hearts, while we think about the significance of this first this morning. Because this is a really important parable for a community of believers for whom the master is away. And of course, that's all of us because Jesus is away and we've been left running the shop. It's actually particularly important for a church community that is without a pastor, as I know you have been for a while now. And you heard earlier on, um, I'm about to take up a position at Central Baptist Church in Paisley. That means they've been without a pastor. They've been without a pastor since uh, late last summer. So this is particularly important as a parable where somebody who would normally be in charge, someone who would normally have their hand on the tiller steering things, has gone away and everybody in the household, that's every one of you in this context, is being asked to pick up the slack, to do perhaps things that they've not done before, to take some level of responsibility that maybe they haven't taken before. Lots of people expected to step in and do stuff. And that's been particularly important, hasn't it, over the last year or more now while we've had lockdown. Right at the very point when church worship has become more passive than ever before, when it's been reduced to a Facebook live stream that you just watch on a screen just like any other TV show. Even when we're back in the building here when we can't sing, and we have to sit and, and we have to listen, as lovely as it is, by the way, to, to, to listen and, and to be sung to. But we can't sing and we can't do the stuff that we would normally do. You can't give a hug to somebody who you've not seen for ages. It's really, really hard. But now is more important than ever that everyone is pulling together and doing the things that need to be done to help overcome that. So what does it mean to be a five-talent person? What does it mean to be a two-talent person? What does it mean to be a one-talent person uh, in in Tillicultry or Paisley uh, or Balfron, where we presently are, or anywhere else? Uh, Well, if you're a multi-talented person, probably everything that crosses your desk, you've you've got a handle on it. You can do it. Um, I don't know how many truly five talent people there are in the world. Maybe you know one or two, somebody for whom nothing is too much trouble. Uh, They seem to understand everything, anything that comes on the TV, on the news. They've got some understanding of world affairs. They know all about science. They know all about the arts. Uh, They can probably play at least two musical instruments. I think we probably all know somebody who is properly multi-talented like that. 
If you are that person in this room, or if there are multiple five talent people in this room, then just get on and do what the Lord has given you to do, whatever that might be. I don't, I don't have a list. I don't know what goes on here during the other six days of the week. But if the Lord has gifted you with these things, don't be embarrassed to have them. You know, don't be embarrassed to be the brightest person in the room if that's you. Don't be embarrassed that whenever there is a meeting to talk about one thing or another thing or something completely different, if you've got something to offer, then don't be embarrassed to do it. The guy with the five talents in the parable was not embarrassed to go and trade with, what was it? What did I say? It was one and a quarter million pounds or thereabouts. That's a huge amount of money. But he wasn't embarrassed to be responsible for that amount of money. He took what he had and he went off and he doubled it. And he came back when the master returned and he handed over another one and a quarter million pounds, another five massive bags of gold. Whatever the gifts are that you have got, use them. Use them in the service of the kingdom because that is what you're called to do. Maybe you look in the mirror in the morning and you think, you know, maybe I'm, I'm a two-talent guy, or maybe I'm a two-talent gal. Well, that's all right. Uh, folk in education, um, I, I have watched my wife go through teacher training in the recent past. I've tried to take an interest in uh, the, all the theories of education and, and everything else, and by no means the expert in the household. That is not my talent. Uh, but one thing that I have come across, um, I kind of come, actually come across it more in my own context being marked on essays at the Baptist College, is this thing called a bell curve. Um, I think it's probably out of fashion in schools now, but the idea is that it's a graph that looks like that. And at one end of the graph, you've got a few people who are exceptionally talented. At the other end, at the bottom of the graph, you've got people who have got various challenges and additional support needs, and they, they, they don't perform as well for all kinds of different reasons. But actually, most people in, in a lecture hall or most people in a class are kind of up here. That's why it's at the top, just because it's more people. That's the bell curve. These are the people who, they're not massively bright, they're not struggling, they're just there in the middle. That's probably most of us. If the Lord's given you a couple of talents, be realistic about what you can do, be realistic about what you can't do, and get stuck in. If somebody asks you to sit on the church hall refurbishment committee and you haven't got a clue about how to buy paint or floor coverings or all the rest of it, then don't do it. Say, look, I'm sorry, I really have got nothing useful to add to that situation. Don't feel obliged to stick your oar in where you know that you've got nothing of value to add. Concentrate on the stuff that the Lord has gifted you to do. Because those two bags of gold, those two talents, they are still worth half a million pounds in today's money. That's a lot. Obviously, we're not talking about actual money. We're talking about the gifts that the Lord has given us. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to read it from the, uh, the NRSV, because not all modern translations still use the word talent. But of course, that is where we get the word talent from in English, this idea that people are gifted. And in the parable, it's bags of gold. But what the parable is really about is the things that you are gifted to do, the things that the Lord has equipped you to do in the world. Do the stuff that he's equipped you to do. Don't do the stuff that he hasn't. Okay, you're missing three talents compared to that person. I suspect probably most people in the room when I said, oh, who's the five talent person in here? Most of you probably have a name in mind. You know, most groups of people have got somebody who is, just seems to be brilliant at everything. It can be really annoying sometimes <laughs> to kind of watch that person and not be that person. But most of us are not that person and that's okay. Just do the stuff that the Lord has equipped you to do and don't worry about the stuff that he hasn't. Because if you do, you can still double your money at the end of it. You can still make another half of... You could end up with a million pounds worth of gold in heavenly terms by the end of it all. And that is no mean feat. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But what if, what if you look in the mirror in the morning and you think, oh, do you know what? I really don't know. I really don't know what I've got. I really don't know who I am. I really don't know if I've got anything to contribute to the kingdom. Maybe at a push, I've got this one thing that I could do. I am that one talent guy. I am that one talent gal. This is where the story gets a little bit dicey. And this is why I I referenced the end times at the end uh, and scary 1970s horror films and all all the rest of that stuff. We don't much like being reminded by Jesus that there are those who will spend eternity outside of the kingdom. We don't much like being reminded that there are those who will spend eternity outside of his presence. And we like it least of all when those reminders come in the context of parables about the kingdom of God. When the people who Jesus is dealing with in these parables are people who are living and working in the kingdom. We don't much like that at all. The next parable, as I, as I already said, is the parable of the, the sheep and the goats. Now, I've known people in the past who got so scared about that parable and worrying that they might turn out to be a goat at the end of the world that they wouldn't even take part in Bible studies when they knew that parable was coming up. Now, I don't want to play down the warning that Jesus has for us here, but I do still want to make sure that we're not fixating on it at the expense of everything else. Because this parable is a deeply encouraging parable. It's a really encouraging, uplifting message about life in the kingdom here and now and the stuff that we can achieve with the abilities that God has given us. Even if when you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, you think you might be that one talent person. Especially if you think you might be that one talent person. This parable is for you more than it is for anybody else. The five talent guy is probably gonna land on his feet wherever he does, because he's good at it. The two talent person is just carrying on with life, just doing what they can, fine. But for you, if you are the one talent guy, the one talent gal, this is for you. And it is still encouraging, because it is a mistake. It's an all too common mistake to read this parable as saying that everyone who's only got one talent is going to mess up life and end up excluded from the kingdom. That is not the message of this parable. And if you were worrying this morning that you might be the struggling one talent guy or the struggling one talent gal, do not take away that from this parable because that is not what it's saying. Every one of the slaves in this story is gifted according to the master's assessment of their ability. So you've got the five talent guy, massive ability. You've got the two talent guy, the top of the bell curve. Most of us are there, just average. And then you've got the one at the, at the trailing end who's struggling for whatever reason. There could be all kinds of reasons why people struggle in life. They may have suffered years of financial stress. They may have had health problems. They may have had a really traumatic upbringing or relationship breakdown. There are all sorts of things that press in on us and drain our energy and prevent us from doing perhaps as much as we would like to have done in service of the Lord. But none of these things mean that anyone is to be excluded. Look at what actually happens here. This guy with the one talent... He takes the talent, he buries it in the ground, and then he waits for the master to return. And the parable tells us that the master is away for an extended period of time. So this bag of gold sits in the ground for a long, long time. Long enough for the other folks who went away and traded with their gold to double their money. And when the master comes back to settle accounts, What does the one talent slave do? Well, first of all, he knows he's messed up. He knows he's messed up because he can see that there's this other two guys here who've doubled their money. And he can hear the master commending them for their faithfulness in trading 
with the stuff that they've been given. And so he knows he's going to have to explain himself. And when he has to explain himself, what does he do? He goes on the offensive. He says some pretty offensive things. He accuses his master of being harsh. He accuses his master of reaping where he did not sow. Are these things even true? Sometimes we assume that they are because the master repeats the words back to the slave. Again, one of the reasons why I wanted to to read it in the NRSV this morning is I think it actually has a pretty good fist at at catching the, the sense of irony in the master's response. He says in verse 26, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. That's not the master saying, yeah, actually I am harsh like that and let me prove it to you. That's the master turning the accusation back on the slave and laying it bare for what it is. It's a lie. It's an absolute barefaced lie designed to deflect the slave's laziness back on to his master and make his own failing somebody else's fault. And what happens after that? Well, think of it this way. First, uh, let, let's look at the, the, the charge that was laid at the master. First of all, The master has given the slaves what he knows they can handle. He's given them five talents or two talents or one talent according to their ability. So on the first count, is the master harsh? No, not guilty, your honor. He's not harsh. He knows what the slaves can handle. He gave five to one. He gave two to another. He gave one to the guy over here. He didn't give five talents to the guy who could only cope with two. He didn't sell the guy, the the super multi-talented guy, with only two talents when he could handle five. He knew his slaves. He wasn't harsh. He's not guilty on that count. What about the next one? That he's unreasonable, sowing, uh, reaping where he did not sow. Well, every farmer knows that if you sow a seed, What comes out of the ground at the end of the season is greater than what you planted into it. Uh, We got a pack of wild seeds a couple of years ago and and chucked them in the ground under our living room window just to see what would happen. And one of them was uh, was an ear of was a a wheat seed, and a whole ear of wheat came up, um, which we left in the garden just for. The, the novelty of it for the year, and then we cut it and brought it inside, and it's still in a vase in our living room today. So I counted the seeds on it this morning before we came out. There were uh, 30 or so wheat seeds on this one ear, and that grew from one. So, in a sense, it's true, a farmer reaps what he didn't sow because you plant one seed and you get 30 back. But that's not unreasonable. That's what's supposed to happen. That's the whole point. Every farmer knows this. And likewise, getting a return on your investment is not reaping where you did not sow. It's just what happens. You put your money in the bank and you get, admittedly not very much, but you get a bit of interest on it. So you get back more than what you put in. So again, on the second count, is the master unreasonable? Not guilty, my lord. He's not unreasonable. He wisely distributed the resources of his household for the best chance of a return, and he sought to reap only what he could reasonably expect from each one of his slaves at the end of the process. It's really important that we get this straight in our heads because it's too easy to look at the judgment of the, uh, that was passed on the one talent guy And they think, oh my goodness, the master's really harsh. Outer darkness, weeping and gnashing its teeth and all the rest of it. And then look in the mirror and think, oh, what happens if I'm the one talent guy? Does that mean that that is what is going to happen to me? No. No. Whatever has happened to you, if you look in the the mirror in the morning and you think, I'm definitely that one talent person. Whether it's ill health, financial distress, 
rotten upbringing, whatever, whatever it is that's pressed in on your circumstances and constricted your ability to serve in the kingdom of God, whatever it is, maybe it's just these last 12 months of lockdown church, online church, novel pastoral issues, strained family relationships, businesses in trouble, and all of that done without a pastor kind of standing here at the front and, and keeping an eye on everything and, and kind of tying everything together and making sure that everybody is looked after, making sure that the people who are responsible for, uh, for pastoral care said, so just go and see that person if I can see that. You, you've, you're missing that person in the keystone position. And it's been difficult. It's been difficult to receive teaching. It's been difficult to receive reassurance. Maybe you've been furloughed and you've been stuck at home and you've been questioning whether you are good for anything at all. And that the best thing you could possibly do right now is dig a hole in the ground, bury your troubles in it and just sit it all out. Because that's what the third slave did with that one talent, that bag of gold coins worth a quarter of a million pounds. You know the person who wins The Apprentice only gets slightly more money than that. Lord Sugar gives out 250,000 pounds to the one person who manages to blag their way through three months of TV. I'm really looking forward to that. Tell you what, when lockdown's over and they can make telly again, that's, that's one of my guilty pleasures is The Apprentice, I have to say. But listen, don't dig a hole in the ground. Even if you've got the one talent, you have got almost as much money as Lord Sugar's apprentice. 15 years wages for a laborer is what that's worth. If you're feeling a bit squashed down, if you're feeling a bit useless, if you feel like you have had a sound thrashing and a good kicking and a clobber around the head, because you've been on the receiving end of this pandemic over the last year. You're not alone, and the master is not harsh, and the master is not unreasonable. He is not the person the third slave made him out to be. I think it's about time that we listen to what the master actually said, rather than how the third slave misrepresented him. All that one talent guy had to do was put the money in the bank. That was all. Now remember folks, this was the days before they started closing all the branches down. It was not difficult. It was probably easier than digging a hole in the ground. You know, I have to drive 20 minutes. They closed my bank down. I have to drive 20 minutes to my nearest bank. I would still rather do that than do gardening. Really don't like gardening at all. Put the money in the bank, the money earns interest. It wouldn't have doubled in value. Even in 15 years, it wouldn't have doubled in value, which tells you something really important about the master's expectations. He was delighted to get five more talents from the one who, who had five, and to get two more from the one who had two. But he wasn't expecting even that much, and he wasn't expecting even that much from the guy who had the one talent. If you could put your money in the bank and earn just a little bit of interest. So how does that relate? Because it, it's not all about the money. I'm not going to break into song even though I'm wearing a Britney. It's not about the money, money, money. The master's expectations are not based on performance. The master's expectation, Jesus' expectation of you is based on faithfulness. His expectation of you is not based on outcomes. Jesus' expectation of you is based on your willingness to serve and to obey his call. Jesus is not harsh. Jesus is not unreasonable. If you feel like you are the one talent gal, and the one talent guy this morning, know this, Jesus knows where you are at. He knows what your abilities are to work in his kingdom. 
and he knows how they have been compromised by this pandemic, by whatever other circumstances there are in your life. He knows that you get up in the morning and wonder whether it would be easier to just go back to bed, to metaphorically bury everything in the bottom of the garden by just burying your head back underneath your pillow and sit it out and wait and see if tomorrow is a better day. But the gift that he has given you, that one talent, and he has gifted you, it will take care of itself if only you will get out of bed in the morning and say to yourself, no, I am not going to bury myself in my fears for the day ahead. I am not going to bury myself in lies about how harsh Jesus is, because he's not. I'm not going to bury myself in self-deception. I'm not going to deny that he has found the right place for me in his kingdom. I am not going to refuse to accept that he believes I can do it even when I don't. He's not expecting the earth of you. So what does banking your talent look like? What does that bare minimum look like? Well, it depends on you, it depends on your circumstances, but here are some ideas. Pray. Pray for the stuff that you know other people need. Pray for yourself. Pray for this village. Pray for this nation. Pick one of the above. If, if you really can only pray just one prayer in the day, pick one of them and pick a different one the next day. If you meet somebody, speak an encouraging word. That could be a, a faith-filled word to somebody in the room here this morning. Or it could be the owner of one of the shops along the high street. How are you doing today? How's business? How are you coping? Speak an encouraging word. When you're allowed to take your mask off, smile. We've all been missing that. Even amongst friends and family, we've been missing the smiles. You know, trying to read somebody's whole face just by their eyes, it's tiring. When you're out and you've got your mask off, just smile. You'll probably get a smile back. You know, most people will instinctively return a smile, except in London, but we're not in London, so don't worry about that. If you're allowed to, give someone a hug. You never know. You know, if you're having an utterly miserable time and you cannot do any of that, then ask for pastoral support from whoever it is who's calling that is in your life. Because if you are utterly crushed and you ask for help, if you ask for prayer, if you ask for support, you will bless them. You will exercise your talent, blessing them by giving them an opportunity to exercise their talent. Because none of this goes on in isolation. This is a worshipping community. This is an expression of the body of Christ. They will deploy their talent into your life by working with you pastorally. You will bless them by giving them a chance to minister to you. And when you bless someone else, then you are exercising the talent that God has given you. And don't forget that what is possible with that one talent is worth even more than that. You may not feel like it now, but he's gifted you. He has done so because he knows your potential. That one prayer that you pray for someone else could be the start of you becoming a fully equipped prayer warrior. That one encouraging word can become a ministry of encouragement. That one pastoral session could become a step towards who knows where for the person that you let into your heart. I know at the, uh, at the beginning uh, you heard that we run a bed and breakfast on the east shore of Loch Lomond, and, and it sounds idyllic. And the east shore of Loch Lomond is idyllic. Running a bed and breakfast, especially at this time of year, less so. 
Uh, we're on the West Highland Way. You get lots of people coming in just for, for one night and then off again. So there's lots of changing beds. There's lots of early starts for, for cooked breakfasts. There's lots of cleaning dirty toilets. It's, you know what, it, it, it's lovely living up there, but, uh, but the bed and breakfast is properly hard work. And five years ago, I had just taken over the B&B solo when Jenny was off uh, working in school for the first time. And I was a very, very low ebb. And I thought to myself, what? what am I doing here? Where am I going? Where are the opportunities for this to grow and develop and become anything? And then again, at this time of year, when I was checking guests out of the bed and breakfast, I couldn't even adequately perform my duties as a, as a leader at Strathendrick Baptist over in Balfron. And the B&B &B just seemed to be compromising everything. And then one of the other leaders of the church came and asked me if I would conduct a funeral. Her brother, also a member of our church, he was terminally ill. And we knew that he didn't have long. And she asked me if I would conduct the funeral because, you know, she's the other church leader. She wasn't going to be able to do it. And so I agreed. I did. And only about a month later, uh, we, uh, we committed Jim to the Lord. And that was the beginning of my journey to where I am now, about to take up uh, full-time pastoral ministry in Paisley, because it was in the crematorium a month later when I sat in the vestry thinking, Lord, what have you done to me? Why am I here? Why am I doing this funeral? I am just me. And his answer there and then as I sat at that desk is, this is where you need to be. This is what I have equipped you to do, and this is what you are going to do. And I went from a squashed down person with a dead end job in one of the most beautiful parts of the world to four years of theological training and now going into full time ministry. See, you look in the mirror and you think you're the one talent guy. You may well not be. You may well have a lot more going for you than you think you do. You might just be going through the mill right now. Well, that's fine because we all do. No matter how gifted or not you think you are, there are things for you to do in the kingdom of God. And I trust that for, for all of you, these strange times that we have been living in have helped you to clarify what that might be. And I pray that as you enter a new phase in your life as a church, as, as you go through the process of looking for somebody to, to stand in that pastoral position and walk that journey with you in the months and the years ahead, as you focus for a while on the gifts and the talents of that person, I pray that in the middle of that you will come to know ever more surely and to invest in ever more certainly the talents that God has given to each and every one of you. Amen. I'm done. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Chris. I could tell you some stories um, about Chris Townsend that would let you know a few things <laughs> about how he's not a one-talent guy, but also how amazing a journey it's been that he's now going to serve God in his own church. So thank you, and thank you for sharing part of your story with us. We're going to sing a song to finish up with. But actually, it strikes me that we're all sitting facing forward. And I'd like to invite you to stand up just for a moment and to turn and look at one another in the building. You won't be on the screen apart from the very front row, so please stand. Please turn to the middle a little bit. It's going to look like a weird Kaylee dance, but please turn and look at one another. This is the body of Christ. This is the family he's placed us in. And these are the people he's gifted with talents to serve his kingdom. And I am so thankful. Are you? Yes, thank you. So let's pray for one another. God, thank you that you've given us gifts. 
not for our egos, for our aspirations, for our pride, but to serve your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters here in the room and those at home and those in other places. We thank you that you give us what we need to serve you, that you are not harsh, that those of us who feel that we have one talent this morning are blessed with all that we need to serve you. And along with that, the sure and certain knowledge that we are your beloved. So God, would you, yeah, would you center that in our hearts today? Would you fill us with that knowledge from the bottom of our feet to the tops of our heads that we are yours? And all God's people said, Amen. Do feel free to sit. <laughs> or stand. together as we close the words of Aaron's lovely blessing. So do, I know it's awkward, turn around, look at one another in the eye. I know the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.